Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Late Bloomer Actor. I am David John Clark, your Late Bloomer Actor, and this is episode eight of season three. Today, I talk to actress and data scientist, Lauren Neal. Lauren is the resident data scientist for Castability, our wonderful sponsor for this show. I have mentioned Castability a lot in discussions, and I wanted to chat with a member of the Castability team to learn more about the app. The app being an audition simulator where actors submit scenes and real casting directors then compare your performance against other actors submitting and rank them in some key metrics. This data is then collated and over time you can learn where your strengths and weaknesses are in those metrics, such as what is your best and worst archetype and where are you strong and weak in terms of genre. And this is where Lauren shines as we discuss her love of data, how she used her understanding of data science in her own acting analysis before castability was even a concept. We look into how she was just a natural fit for the castability app, and we will get a great insight into the benefits of being a member of the castability crew. Lauren is a SAG-AFTRA actor, director, and writer, and she is currently a Master's of Science degree candidate in the University of Virginia's online data science program, eager to innovate methods by which to marry filmmaking with statistical modeling and machine learning. This is a great chat about understanding yourself as an actor and learning from your data as an actor to progress yourselves forward. So here we go. Enjoy the wonderful Lauren Neal. Welcome everyone to this wonderful episode of The Late Bloomer Actor. Today I'm very excited to be chatting to one of the wonderful team members of our current sponsor, the Castability app. Lauren Neal, coming to us today from Los Angeles. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you so much for having me. Super it excited to be here. Thank you very much for coming on. I've, I've wanted to chat to someone from Castability as I've been a great supporter of the show for a couple of years now and I've been a user of the app, so I've love the benefits that we get from it. So that's what we're here to talk about today, as well as who Lauren Hill is as part of the um, castability team and an actress out of LA, I believe. Is that correct? That is all true. Guilty as charged. <laughs> <laughs> as I said, I'm a big fan of castability, uh, which I believe is still in beta develop development. And listeners will learn a lot about it in this episode. I'll chat about castability being a supporter of the podcast later, but I'd love to firstly dive into your background, Lauren, as an actor and data scientist for Castability. How did you become a data scientist and how or why did you focus on the data of acting? Yeah, great questions, because I know it's kind of a weird combo. Mm -hmm. It's always sort of piques the interest of people who hear that. I think it's a little unexpected. I am a performer at heart. I've always been an artist, but I've always also had a math brain. So, um, as far as I can remember, sort of a couple of years ahead in math classes and things like that. Then I went to college, though, and I didn't touch math or science at all. I went to a university where you literally have no undergraduate requirements at all. You can okay. take whatever you want from the minute that you get to school. So there was no mandate to take math or science or anything like that. And I didn't. I had completely pushed it away, pushed it aside, thought maybe I would never return to it. Mm. And then the pandemic came along. And so the pandemic encouraged me uh, and my wife both to go back to school. But it's also, you know, I've, I've been an actor for a long time, but I've always had an interest in other aspects of filmmaking. Um, so I've directed things, I've edited, I've mm -hmm. done other roles on set. And I've always or started to sort of develop this interest in sort of applications of AI and machine learning to, to filmmaking, which is funny now in retrospect, just because that's sort of all anyone can talk about. But four years exactly. ago... This was like a novel thing. Well, it wasn't novel. I mean, people have been in AI research for decades, but it felt novel at the time. Mm. And I felt like anyone that I talked to about sort of what I wanted to do and what I wanted to focus on, mostly image and video data, again, trying to develop maybe some, some tools to help independent filmmakers increase the production value of their projects. Uh, none of my professors at the time really kind of even knew where to guide me. Wow. And then, yeah, so I, it's interesting because it, it does feel like it was a prescient choice, obviously. Um, and it so, sort of, yeah, thrust me into this space right now where everyone's talking about data and AI and the arts, oddly. It, it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, I've mentioned data science to people and you just sort of get a blank face straight away. So no one really understands it. But I guess it 
would um, cover so many different aspects of society in general, not just acting. I, I can see it um, being used in uh, the stock market and, um, and business and economics is where you would probably lean towards it. So is that what came first, your love for, the, for data or, or was it acting first um, growing up, so to speak? What would you say was your first? Sure. Acting 100%. Beautiful. Always. Everything that I do um, feels like it's sort of funneled toward my passion for that. And that seems to be the most foundational drive and uh, passion that, that I have within me is for acting. Everything else around it sort of is um, builds a bigger picture of what it means to be an artist or a performer or someone who works in mm. film or consumes films or works in other aspects of film. And it just so happens that there was a shift I think I made a couple of years ago when I started to understand that data is not just right what we think of uh, in terms of economic stock market, the, the numbers, right? The, the things mm. that are sort of obviously built for data and calculations, statistics, mathematics. Any information, any piece of information that has some value is data, right? Beautiful. So mm. the facial expression you're making right now, right? I could ingest that as real-time data, right? To how you're responding to things. Like every, everything we do, every action we take online or social media, right? All of it, if you are gathering it, collecting it, mining it, could be treated as a, a data set. Okay. I, I, do you think that... Um data used in that way can be truth-telling? 100%. It can be mm. truth-telling. You can also manipulate it and decide what it means, right? You can ascribe meaning of your own to data sometimes too. So it becomes tricky that way where you have to make sure that, you know, you're interpreting. We, we like to be on the other end, right, where we're interpreting data, we, we look at a chart and we think, okay, what is, what is this telling me? Um, we think of a little bit less, I think, about the actual data that goes in on the front end, right? It's like if you're trying to find the average home price for the last 10 years, you can look at that chart and sort yep. of read whatever it's telling you. But if they didn't actually ingest all of the home prices in the region, right, that's relevant to your research or what have you, then that's actually completely useless information. Fair enough, fair enough. And, and obviously with anything, that data can be manipulated to, to serve your own purpose as well, isn't it? So we could see the dark side of it and we'll talk about AI a little bit later. So sure. how you take that data in could be used um, for want of a better word against someone or something, couldn't it? Yeah, it definitely could. I think it's what castability does that is so unique to me is that it's really trying to quantify something that we usually, we can't put into numbers, right? Mm -hmm. Our acting, our, our art form, you know, we feel our way through things. There's not a rubric that we hit every time that we know we're going to book it if we do these five things, but certainly it's, it's one of those things whenever I consult or meet with someone who's using the app, I try to make sure that they understand that's not the that's not the final word on your acting either. There's some truth to derive um, from any data, really, but it's not the be-all and end-all. There, there might be other sources that you need to pull from to get the full picture. Awesome. And so that's a great segue into the app and acting. So how does data science uh, relate to acting in general? And what's your understanding of castability and how does your role as a data scientist become a part of castability? It's funny because thinking about data in relationship to an actor's career, I try to suggest that actors start to reframe how they think about, you know, their day to day. Basically, sort of what I said before, any action that an actor takes, right, could be considered a part of their the data set, right, mm -hmm. of like all the things that they're pulling in that's going to ultimately, ideally produce an outcome of a successful actor, whatever that definition of success is for that individual. So if I go to class, I could take a list of every class that I've been to in Los Angeles, count the number of hours, out the techniques that I've learned, the scenes that I've worked on. You can see very quickly how when we start to actually write all that down, gather and collect all of that, that's your data set. 
That's mm. your living record of your acting career, right? Everything that you've done to support. If you took a fencing class, right? you went to the gym, all of those things are really kind of uh, different branches of an actor's sort of vast data set of everything that they're doing to try to produce the outcome that they want. So yeah, every class you've taken, uh, the number of headshots you've taken, uh, the types of headshots. Do you only wear specific outfits when you audition? Are you testing whether or not your headshot with glasses, right, yields more auditions? Wow. All of those things, right, are opportunities actually where that's data. That's mm. data. Right? You're talking about booking ratios, avail ratios. Those are, that's data. So before I even knew castability existed, I created a sort of record, a database of all of my auditions that I'd ever been on in LA because I think there was a part of me that just wanted to be able to see the work. We put out so much. We put so much into the universe that we never see a return from as actors. Mm -hmm. Definitely. That I wanted to say, okay, let me make a list of every audition and, and see if there's something I can pull from here. Can I, these auditions didn't give me anything back in the sense that maybe I didn't book this one or this one, I didn't make any money, but can I derive some other meaningful information from what is presented here. Notice every time there's a breakdown that uses these adjectives, I seem to do better. Or these casting directors make up 50% of my auditions, wild. You know, maybe I should talk to my reps about that. All of those things are opportunities for, for any actor to sort of take a second look at the data that they are producing daily with every action that they take and investigate, you know, how can I exploit this to try to improve, you know, what I want to in my career or get where I want to go. Wow. Wow. That's very interesting. I do a lot of, um, uh, so I'm a, a bodybuilder. I have been for years. So I, I, mm. I do a lot of spreadsheets and record my, you know, my training, my diet. And I can see the concepts of, I, I've already do a little bit of data science in that area as well, I suppose. And I can see the, how um how big a gamut you can take that from so it's wonderful right um, with castability how did you get involved with them because it sounds like you would almost be the backbone of the app so to speak um so did they come to you or were you part of the development of the app and explain how castability works in the uh, data science area definitely um, so I was an actor who heard about one of the Castaway Cancer initiatives that Castability was a co-sponsor mm. of several years ago. I heard about Castability that way. And then when they were hiring for someone who both had professional acting experience and uh, data expertise, I thought, this is wild. What am I seeing here? Has any actor, at least in LA, knows? It's very hard to find any job posting where it's like, we want actors and right? Your other your random other skill skills. Set. Yeah. You must have been like, this, this is written for me. Actually, 100%. I was still wow. in my grad school program, but I right away just like started writing a cover letter because I just thought this is interesting. This is exactly the sort of thing that I enrolled in grad school to try to, you know, dig into a little bit more, right? Again, applications of this super technical scientific thing to an artistic practice. It's really exciting to me. So I connected with Jay, who is the CEO of Castability. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I was just so excited by what I saw as the future of this. I mentioned before, Castability is still technically in beta. There are mm -hmm. lots of plans uh, to improve the app, uh, a new version of the app coming way, way, way down the line. Um, I shouldn't say way, way, way. We'll see. But yes, all of those things are forth. There are they are out there, all, everyone. And on their way. And so, yeah, I've been really a part of the conversations to decide how do we start to talk about data? So I wasn't a part of the team when some of the initial metrics were decided upon, things like believability, mm -hmm. creativity, but I've been a part of conversations and uh, basically plans to think about how can we deliver this information to actors? So as you know, there are reports that we send uh, currently we're working on pulling that data into the app so that actors can actually sort of manipulate it themselves and, Beautiful. Um, you know, have a dashboard essentially that they can sort of customize and use it more tailored to what they want. So again, you know, these are things that have been on the back burner and sort of driving us as we move forward and, 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 you know, try to get new users, 
we're so testing, making sure that what we're even offering is something that actors want to do, you know, place to practice, uh, real casting directors looking at them. And then the data piece, uh, I think it's because it's so new and because it's something not anyone really is doing anywhere else, is something that is constantly evolving. Mm, beautiful. And before we dive into the nitty gritty of, of how the app works, if you were to speak to someone today that has never heard of castability uh, and the app, uh, how would you explain the, the concept behind it and what, uh, it, how it would benefit them as an actor? Definitely. I think probably the simplest way to explain it first is that this is a place for actors to practice self-taping. Practice, obviously they're acting, but in a self-tape setting, right? That sort of lights up, right? And you go right into the scene and then we close out on it. Basically everything that happens in between there and there. <laughs> which, is the, um, which is the backbone of acting today, isn't it? Everything it, is self-taping. So. It is. It absolutely is. Um, so that's first and foremost what it is. It's a place for actors to, to practice that. What's great is that it's not just practice. Right? You can submit your scenes uh, along with a lot of other actors who are participating in the same scene. Real working casting directors are watching these scenes, reviewing them, and basically picking ranking actors based on those metrics, those proprietary castability metrics, uh, things that we've deemed important, believability, creativity. Um, and so they basically develop for those actors. Um, it's not a, it's not like we're scoring actors out of some system that's a uh, hundred points, right? Mm. We're not saying 100 points is good acting, right? And the closer you get to that, yes, you've hit it. Your acting was good today, right? That doesn't really make sense because we all know acting doesn't really work that way. Yeah, so, you, could, you couldn't really rate an actor on that because it's, it's, it's such a, what's an artistic endeavor, really, isn't it? Right. It's, how, do you, how do you rate a painting on a wall out of 10, really? Because, um, I mean, it's like anything, but I might look at that and not understand the concepts of that painting and give it a one, whereas you might look at it and have a complete understanding of the depths and everything on it, and it's on your forte, so. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's why it, it didn't make sense to the team to create any sort of system that defines what makes good acting. Right? And that's also not how the business works. We are always mm. functioning and operating in relationship to other actors. The other actor is the one who booked it over me. I'm not mm. just out there trying to get some role that's just floating in the ether, right? It's just like, once you hit 99 points, you've got it, right? You it's not, it. that's not how it works. It's like, <laughs> you might be a 98, but this person might look a little closer to what somebody had in mind. So mm. that might be what, what tips them over the edge. So over time, the idea is that, you know, you submit scenes and castability, those casting directors rank you in relationship to the other actors who have performed the same scenes. And once you've amassed enough scenes and then those subsequent rankings, you can start to look at that data that you've generated and, and identify trends, patterns, uh, insights into where you might be able to improve um, other types of scenes or archetypes that might be well suited to you that you haven't thought about before. Kind of roles that when you get an audition, that's this archetype are just, it's going to come naturally to you mm. and which ones you might have to work a little bit harder because it's just not, it doesn't sit in your body the same way. Mm. Um, uh, it's interesting because I, I love the term that castability uses is that the app is an audition simulator, mm. um, which is exactly what it is. So you mentioned archetypes, which is a big part of the app. So how do the archetypes work in the app and how does that work with the, the science and the data science behind it? Definitely. In data science, you'll hear about parameters. Any sort of model, uh, data science model, statistical model that someone is building uh, is fed different parameters. And those are essentially like the variables, the, the guidelines. It's like x squared plus y squared equals whatever, right? The x and the y are those variables that kind of change. Uh, archetypes for castability is one of those primary parameters that we're using that we kind of plug in. And then when we give actors all of that data, that's just one, one sort of side of the picture, right? Another side of that picture are the genres and types of scenes that you're working on. So obviously in the industry, if you are auditioning for film, TV, 
there's a big difference in the mm -hmm. types of sides that you'll receive. If it's multicam, if it's uh, an indie film, um, if it's a procedural drama. And so essentially the archetypes work in tandem with the genres. So we have genres, those are types of scenes. Archetypes are types of people, types of characters, types of roles, essentially. So I, I think for actors, we have to think a lot about type and obviously we're trying to break stereotypes. So I, I think it's important to sort of distinguish between stereotypes, which has a negative connotation and, and archetypes. You've heard a lot of people say things like stereotypes come from somewhere, right? There's mm -hmm. some innate truth or something that spiraled and yes, maybe took a negative bent at some point and became insulting, but maybe there's a kernel of truth in there somewhere. The archetype is really kind of just where that kernel of truth is. The, the essence of a person, the sort of uh, core of who they are and what drives them and motivates them. Like what kind of person is that, right? Are they someone who sits on the sidelines and, and um, is more easygoing? Are they a leader? Are they a, you know, a, a hero character? Are they an antagonistic character? That's what the archetypes are meant to do. Um, it's basically compartmentalizing different types of roles and characters so that it's easier for actors to start to say, oh, rebel scenes. I score pretty well there. Interesting. Maybe that's that's the kind of role that, that I should be pursuing because it seems to fit me well. Um, or innocent. Wow, horrible scores on these. But for some reason, every audition I'm getting is this type. Maybe I need to investigate that. Maybe I need to take a class specifically to target that. All that long-winded business, <laughs> just to say, I love it. archetypes, um, maybe an even better way to describe it is that you've seen these archetypes throughout history in many iterations. There are Jungian archetypes you might have heard of that come from psychology, right? Carl Jung. Mm -hmm. um, those are very similar actually, to the archetypes that castability uses. It's not because we've copied those or, you know, we're trying to steal from young and make it our own. It's literally just these are the kind of archetypes that generally appear throughout all types of storytelling and all of history. Um, and so any discussion of, of character types will have some of these characters or, or, or archetypes within it. Right? Mm. They're sort of a universal characters uh, that we see play out in media, in life, uh, and that's what that's meant to do, is sort of identify and codify what kind of roles those are. I, I mean, and that's that's life in general, isn't it? We're all made up of, of different character types, and that's what storytelling is, in, in a sense. Uh, um, I'm not big on understanding uh, movies and stories, but I understand that there's only a, a, a certain amount of types of stories that you can have, you know, drama, right. love and, and uh, 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 war, all that sort of stuff. So in essence, that's what we're doing every day as people and as actors, we're applying those characters. And I love what you were talking about learning where we're strong in that because we think in certain areas, oh, I, I want to be the, the uh, leading man or the tough guy, so to speak. Um, but then when you do something like castability and the data starts to come back, you can be surprised. And I've been very, very surprised that to get some peaks in the, uh, in the comedic area, which <laughs> surprised me. <laughs> um, and you, but you don't go in it. To, you, you'll do the roles where they come up and that's what they're, um, they're measuring and you'll just deliver the scene like you do in an audition. And then it, when that data starts to come back over um, several scenes of the same nature, it's quite surprising to learn that. And I found that interesting um, that we can take it for two prongs now. You can look at the positives of where your strengths are and say, well, I'm going to start focusing on those roles now. Or if you, like you said, you're getting all these auditions in an archetype that you're now failing in, you're, and you look at the data and go, geez, I, I suck at drama, but all my <laughs> auditions are drama. Now I can learn how do I, do I just not do those auditions anymore or do I go and get some teachings to, to be a better dramatic actor? Absolutely. You know, I, I've spoken to actors who have started to apply the same archetypal categorization to the the real auditions that they get. Mm -hmm. When audition comes from their reps and they read the sides, the first thing they do is think, okay, which archetype or which castability archetype is this? Just to start to 
get a handle on how do I approach this scene? Where does this character, where is this character really coming from? Where is their drive situated? Where is their anger situated? You know, what, what's historically um, has, has motivated them? Um, that, that sort of thing. I think uh, that sort of archetypal study um, is, is used in uh, like actors comedy studio here in LA uses an archetype um, okay. thing in their classes. So, you know, it's, it's something that you can apply to any scene that comes across your desk for any reason. That's interesting. And now as a lover of the data yourself, and you said you've started to use it in your own acting, are you allowed to use the, the app yourself and, and, and have access to your own data? Because I think you'd find that very exciting, wouldn't you? That's Actually fascinating. I don't, I haven't actually inquired about the, the ethical um, overlap of that. I think I just sort of took myself out of commission. Um, of course. You know, I understand just that as completely, a, but uh, yeah, because of the nature of how it is with uh, real casting directors of, of which as a working actor, you'll, you'll be submitting for real roles. So I could almost imagine you um, biting at the bit to sort of have access to that sort of data over time. Right, yeah, it just would be a little funny, right, to of see course. all the castability employees like winning scenes. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure. So I understand that. Now, uh, castability uses uh, their own writers to make their own scenes up. Uh, do you have any involvement in um, in pushing them on on how to deliver what scene so it matches that data, so it's focused on the archetypes and the um, and the metrics that you need? Yeah, it's actually interesting because um, the individual on our team who I would say sort of uh, monitors that more than anyone else um, is Amanda Doyle, who's our mm -hmm. resident um, casting director at Castability. She's really the one, you know, just making sure that scenes feel like they're of the genre, that they are, um, you know, the right format, right? Um, that there's nothing untoward right, in scenes or, you know, those sorts of things. I have a little bit of a less hand in that, uh, helping the writers make that practical leap or step. Um, but there's definitely an effort uh, that the team is making to make sure um, that 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 is that we're not throwing a bunch of comedic scenes in with the drama and, you know, messing folks' uh, mm -hmm. data up. Interesting. And with the app, obviously, it's worldwide now and you can, you can participate wherever you're from. So I, I'm an Australian and I participate. Is there any effect of you not being an American, so to speak? It obviously would be very US-centric. Um, a lot of mm. the actors are all US accents. So if I come in and I'm doing my scene as an Australian, um, unfortunately, I haven't tied down the American accent yet. Would that make any differences to the assessment of that scene and, and the data that would come back? I think so 100%, and I will tell you why. Uh, we all have implicit biases and sort of ideas about people um, and their origins, you know, based on what they look like and based like mm -hmm. on what they sound like. You know, we would be liars if we said that we, we don't see or hear or take any of that into account when we first experience another individual. In fact, I think that that's something that actors have to learn and accept over time is that there is something that we carry with us into any room that we of enter. Course. And sometimes that works for roles, sometimes it's not quite right. And so likewise, with a, an accent, a dialect of any kind, I think it can actually give you a lot of in, in interesting information. It's like, maybe you start trying, you know, your American accent, uh, at some point when you do nail it down and you notice that when you do the same scene with an American accent and Australian one, for some reason, the interpretation of, of your Australian accent is more dramatic or more comedic mm. for whatever reason. That could give you as an Australian actor insight into how Americans might perceive an Australian accent. So if you get an audition and it doesn't specify accent to use or it no. says you know, natural accent, it's fine, whatever. But you know, in your experience, submitting scenes and your Australian accent on castability, that for some reason, you seem to struggle in more dramatic scenes. There's some implicit bias, maybe, that Americans have against that mm -hmm. accent. Maybe you elect next time to try, you know, your real audition with an American accent, just to see what the outcome is. That's mm -hmm. just one example um, of a way that you could think about the data that you're getting back. There's something sort of inherently uncomfortable, honestly, about it, because we have to say and acknowledge, wow, 
somebody on the other end might not like my Aussie accent. Like that really sucks. But honestly, mm. that is what the business is, right? Exactly. There are people who don't like our nose, our eyelash, our earlobe, whatever it is. And I think the more honest that we can all be as actors about you know, what people might be responding to that we have to offer, the more targeted we can be with mm. our pursuit of roles and work. Yeah, and that's interesting because obviously um, when you're learning the American accent, one of the biggest thing is um, understanding the culture because uh, mm. Americans' voice is, is their culture. It's who they are and are very different. Whereas Australians, we tend to sit back. Um, we talk a lot slower. We, we're, not, we're not fighting each other to get in, involved in the conversation, whereas America's um, been around a lot longer and there's a lot more people, so they tend to speak more aggressively. So that makes part of the character, doesn't it? And I can see how that would then come through castability. And it's interesting because I did a um, post-apocalyptic scene a little while back and I, I delivered it with my Australian accent and I, was, um, I, I won that one, which <laughs> was brilliant. So there is a very good example of where it can work because we're talking a genre, a, a, a production that could be non-american for want of a better right a, a international mm. transnational mm. multinational and Definitely. that right is a way for you to even get insights about where the industry is because mm. if you're winning scenes in sci-fi post-apocalyptic i know why right i'm like i'm thinking oh the last of all these huge shows where it kind of doesn't matter where people are from right there's mm -hmm. all accents from all over or the world has collapsed, right? And so certain countries don't even exist anymore or, you know, whatever it is. Mm. And it might tell you, oh, wow, I might have a better shot as somebody who has not developed a great American accent yet in these genres. Maybe I should tell my reps, this is kind of where I should focus because they're not going to demand that I have this, you know, American accent tomorrow for this procedural, right? So mm. I, I think- I love it. You have to kind of get creative uh, in your use of the data, you know, and there are sort of creative interpretations um, that, that you can, uh, when you get used to sort of looking at it and interpreting it, your mind will start to, over time, make these leaps better and make those connections. Awesome. Awesome. And I just wanted, I, um, I'm going to go in on, in a second and talk about you as an actress and where you work, etc. But one of the biggest uh, questions I'd like to ask just for castability is that, and this comes a lot when people do calm workshops with casting directors, is that this is an audition simulator. It's for you to learn and grow yourself. But um, actors can't expect to, that to be their, their way into any of the casting directors. I, we don't know who they are anyway, but okay. this is all about you learning and growing yourself, isn't it? It is. And, you know, and I can tell you, we have incredible casting directors that, that work for castability and who are reviewing scenes. And, you know, it's kind of that same, I have a casting director who has called me in, I don't know, five or six times in the last like two years. And I just, all I can think, right, is that they want to cast me in something and are trying because they like me, but they're just, you know, waiting for the right thing to come along. You can kind of think about your work on castability like that. You know, mm -hmm. Casting directors will remember you if you are submitting scenes. Yes, that cannot be the reason why you're using castability. It, it really has to be about your self-growth, about mm -hmm. you and your work and, and trying to really hone in on on your essence as an actor and which archetypes and genres work the best for you. If you go in thinking like the outcome that I want to see is one of these casting directors calling me in for a role, you know, you probably aren't going to have that outcome. Let's just be honest. Right. And so mm. if that's what you're waiting for, then you're going to feel like a failure using the app. Whereas if you're like, I just want to improve one point <laughs> from this week to next, chances are, you're going to feel better, better about yourself because those are goals you can control. Exactly. And that's the same when you go into a workshop with a casting director or anyone like that. You're there to learn and to walk away as a better actor, not to make that network connection, so to speak, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. It's, a, it's a, an opportunity to practice. Mm. All right. Now, let's talk about Lauren just quickly before we wind up. Uh, you've got over 33 credits in IMDb, including the wonderful <laughs> series Westworld, uh, which I'm still trying to finish. I have a long list of TV shows that I've tried to catch up on. And oh, the joys don't of we all? Working. <laughs> where, where are you on your acting journey? And, and can you give any insights into lessons you've learned on the way that may benefit 
any actor, whether they're young or um, a late bloomers like myself. Yeah, I think so. Uh, my acting journey has been really fascinating. You know, I, I've been in Los Angeles for uh, just over 13 years now. Wow. Um, and my career is really interesting because most of my work is still independent projects. Right. So I've done a couple of co-stars. Um, I did just book in the last month a recurring uh, co-star on a new show. So I'll be in a couple episodes of, of a new show later this winter. Awesome. Um, but, you know, I haven't done a huge long list, laundry list of guest stars and things like that. And a lot of my own acting journey has been really developing a robust relationship with my understanding of myself and where I'm nice. suited and, and where I won't be suited. You know, um, I, which is what we've just been talking about, isn't yeah. it? Through the castability. Yeah, it's wonderful. It, exactly. Exactly. And that's again, why this app just immediately felt like kindred spirit with me, you know, because it's hard when you don't book things and you're trying to figure out what it is. Um, I've always said acting is a bit like falling in love. You, you might be an cr incredible human being, but not the right match for this specific individual. And that's kind of actors mm. with every single role. Chances yes. are you're not going to be the right match for most roles. And so if you are like me, I have a certain kind of ethnic amb ambiguity. Um, there's certain things I've accepted about myself um, long ago that, again, what we were talking about, like what you carry with you when you walk mm. into a room, um, that mean that, you know, the the roles out there that exist that are really well suited to me, there are fewer of them. Okay. Um, and so a lot of that has meant that, you know, I, I work on my own independent projects. I have a, a film uh, that's going to be on the festival circuit uh, just starting this month. That's an independent production lead of that wow. film and sort of the driving force behind uh, that film getting off the ground because I wanted to act in a project, you know? So it's like, yes, I'll make my that, own. Yeah. And that's I, really the spirit of castability. That's people saying, mm. I want to be able to actually do something about my acting. I don't want to mm. just sit and wait for an audition to come. I want to work on stuff now. Fair enough. And, and, and you would see this as well when you're doing your auditions, not getting that feedback back from the casting directors. You, so you don't know why you've not got that. And we've, we've already discussed it, that it can be the smallest thing. So you just, your eye color's not right but you don't get that feedback back. Whereas castability, you're starting to get that data coming back. So you can, uh, it lifts you a little bit to say, well, no, I don't just suck. <laughs> right. And you, yeah. you also can watch those other tapes, right. Of, of individuals maybe who won the scene over you. And you might think, mm. oh, they're just kind of more naturally suited to this language than I am. These words felt uncomfortable in my mouth and they sound great coming out of this person's, you know, particular personality. I, I think that's really valuable too. That's part of why I do keep track in my personal acting career of who books roles that I audition for. It's not to, you know, envy, you know, look on enviously um, once the show's on better. air. <laughs> yeah, it's really not that at all. No, in fact, it's sometimes watching and saying, oh, if that's what they wanted, then I 100% know why I didn't get that. That's not like me at all or that delivery or this like take on it, or that person is completely different than me, right? Energetically, spiritually. Mm. And that's, yeah, that's helpful. Right. You know, I think that that's like a nice solve, uh, sal really, not solve mm. <laughs> I should, uh, for an actor, um, a bomb, right? Something that can yes. say, it's okay. You know, you didn't get this, but I can see why I didn't get it and therefore I can be okay with that on to the next one, as opposed to seeing somebody do a performance and you know that you could actually do it better than them, mm. right? Or something like that. Like that's devastating. Of course. And I love that because I think as actors, we all need to know that we're all going on the same journey and we're all suffering uh, the, the same ups and downs. And you need to know that it's not all about you in a negative way that you've been seen by the casting director, you've been considered, and you just never know where that door is going to lead you later on. Definitely. You also don't want to end up on set performing a role that's not really meant for not you. Really. That definitely. You feel uncomfortable. You don't feel prepared for. 
you don't feel like you have those skills, you don't feel like you are the best person for that role because then you're going to be questioning yourself. And if criticism comes when the episode airs, then you are already doubting yourself. And so that's going to get under your skin. So anyway, all that just to say, I think the things that are meant for us will come to us if we are ready when the opportunity presents itself. Awesome. And as we wind up, I, I did want to just go back quickly. We, we have talked about AI a little bit. I've seen a wonderful photo of you on Instagram, particularly looking very Sarah Connor type <laughs> holding a machine gun, but it was for a discussion of AI. What's your thoughts on AI in the acting industry? Is it a good thing, a bad thing, or a combination of both, do you feel? Both, always. Um, anyone yeah. who tells you otherwise is um, oversimplifying the issue. Mm. Right. There are there are benefits and there will be, you know, negative things. And I think that's why castability users with their sort of beginning for foray into data will actually have an advantage over people who are just now hearing about AI and, and whatnot for the first time. Look, I'm also an independent filmmaker. And so having been someone who is responsible for editing a film or finding resources for a film. Um, AI could be really useful for truly independent, under-resourced filmmakers who really, sure. truly do not have access to certain types of technology to create certain types of films or stories. Do I think that major studios who have buku bucks need to be doing that? Uh, not really. At the same time, though, that we're in this position in the industry right now, in part because budgets got too expensive, mm -hmm. now we're in this pullback period where... We can't spend $20 million an episode on every single show. So maybe there will be a trade-off at some point where mm. we get more shows or more auditions again because the shows are a little bit less expensive. That might mean there's you know, some production costs being cut somewhere somehow. It's really a dance. And I yes. think that the more actors know about the subject, the better that they will be and the better that they'll be prepared for what is coming because it really is a nuanced discussion. You know, I, I think there are appropriate use cases for AI and I think there are absolutely inappropriate use cases for AI. And I think every performer is going to need to decide sort of where that line is for themselves as well. Yeah. And a lot of people are saying the worst case scenario. I mean, uh, i did a background job on Mortal Kombat that was filmed here in Adelaide and it was a, a big fight scene. There was hundreds of extras used in this fight scene to be part of the crowd, which all those extras were paid, you know, a reasonable amount of money. We we're there for a couple of days each and all uh, full day. So that's a lot of money on the budget, whereas they can now use AI and just put in a crowd, so to speak, which I can see the benefits for an independent producer such as yourself. You couldn't afford to have a crowd scene and if, you've, if that's pivotal to your story then being able to use AI and make that would be a good thing. So unfortunately, that's the future going forward. And maybe there won't be as much background work for background actors. Unfortunately, it's just the nature of life moving forward, isn't it? It is. And, and you know, it's unfortunate because that's experience, right? Background work, I think, 12 years ago for the first time for a film and, you know, learned a lot, kind of watched, saw what different people did on set, which what different roles did. Oh, that's mm. a second AD. Oh, a third AD. That's new. You know, learning things while observing. And so I think that 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 is something that we're going to have to account for. We're in a situation where people can't work as background actors as much. How do we get that education then, that onset education. Yes. Uh, and I think mm. that those are the things that I, I want us to start thinking about, right? How do we make sure that we still have opportunities to, to learn how to do this? Mm. It's interesting because um, myself as a late bloomer, I've got a full-time career, which I'm uh, slowly approaching retirement and I'll be able to do my acting and not have to rely on it. Whereas my son is in his first year of um, drama, uh, a three-year drama degree now. And it's sort of interesting how is his career as an actor going to go forward it's, he's got so many years and it's such a changing environment now it's going to be interesting to see where it goes in the next 10 to 20 years isn't it it is i mean mm. the same that we have an influencer agreement for saga after now and we didn't used to the thing is yes things have always sort of changed and morphed over time to sort of align with where the technology is is taking us so yeah, it's, it's a to work with it. fascinating time. <laughs> awesome, Lauren. Um, finally, as an actor and a data scientist, what would you like to instill in an actor as to how they should move forward in their career? If you had to sit down with a new actor or any actor that asked you, how do I make my career progress? It is history. It's, it's information, right? So what's really cool about it is that in investigating and kind of looking back through your own data as a way to improve moving forward right that's 
sort of the fundamental rule of all things, right? Learn from our past. It's, it's a really great way to get to know yourself too. You know, it's kind of like the first time I ever saw myself on camera. I had no idea what I was going to look like. I had no idea how the camera would pick up my, the movements of my eyes, right? Big eyes. So I was like, oh, I don't need to widen them that much. That's too much. Right? So it's, it's cool what we get to do as actors if you treat it that way as a learning opportunity. Um, every time I see myself on camera, I feel like I'm learning. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Like what kind of vibes coming off of me right now and why and or oh maybe i shouldn't turn that way <laughs> like that's not the best angle for me all sorts of things like I that like right mm. and so when you're thinking about yes your ranks are like the the number rankings on castability for scenes that you've submitted yes that's data there's all kind other kinds of actor data too that you create on the daily that you can kind of compile right and and put with your data from castability and make this sort of massive data set of, of really interesting stuff that you can learn from, you know, whether that's pulling up old self tapes once the show finally airs and, and comparing your tape to the performance. We do have a lot more as actors than we think. I know we, again, submit those tapes and never think about them again, but every actor probably has at least a few gigabytes of, of old tapes that they could go mm. and look at if, if, if they wanted. They decided they wanted to improve themselves in any way, right? We, we, have, we have more than we think. We've got our records of auditions. We've got, we might not have feedback, right? We might not have feedback from those casting directors, but, I love that. right? You have your outcomes. You may have what your reps thought. You might have the, the castability information that you have about archetypes and, and what might be suited better. You know, there's ways that we can have more power and agency. Uh, we just might have to dig a little bit more to get, to get there. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you very much, Lauren. Uh, thank you for coming on the podcast. I've been blown away by your information into the concepts of understanding archetypes and understanding the data that castability uses. So I, I look forward to my journey continuing with castability and seeing where you and your team take the app as it comes out of beta and, and the improvements that you've already talked about. Everyone that I've said, uh, spoken to that uses it loves the concept and loves the results that we get from it as individuals and to be able to push ourselves forward in this wonderful journey that we're all chosen to, <laughs> to, to, to follow. So thank you. I love that. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a blast. Thank you very much. And uh, as I like to say, maybe I'll see you on set someday. <laughs> be great. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow, there you go. Who would have thought that mathematics, aka data science, could be so interesting, but also so valuable to us as actors? I'm really glad that we had the opportunity to chat with Lauren to discuss the benefits of the Castability app to get a, a greater insight into how actors can use it to improve themselves. And make sure you check out the Castability app. You can find it in the Apple Store as well as in Google Play for Android users. And check out all the information on how it works online. You can find them at www.castability.com. Act as a listener of my show, you can also get a discount on your membership by using the promo code The Late Bloomer Actor when signing up. So jump on board for that one for sure. Uh, thank you for joining me on this wonderful episode. Lauren was just fantastic to speak with and learn from. So I hope you get something out of the discussion as much as I did. Cheers, and as always, I'll see you on set.